So, I'll get started. Um, I, uh, I have... Shall I introduce you? Yeah, oh, sorry, sorry, <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's okay. It's like I was right there practicing. <laughs> um, welcome, uh, welcome you. Start again. It's, uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening. My name is uh, James Bowe. I'm the Communications Officer at Rare. I'd like to thank you for joining us this evening for our latest installment of the Conversation for Conservation, our last of the early 2022 season. We are so pleased you can join us, join us along with our guest speaker, Sarah Martin, who is here to discuss why livestock is so important to the land and how we can go about fighting climate change with livestock. Before I introduce Sarah, I'd like to acknowledge the territory that we are on. As I'm speaking from Cambridge tonight, the Rare Charitable Research Reserve acknowledges and is grateful to all of the original stewards of the land on which Rare resides. We are within the Holloman Tract, spanning six miles, on either side of the Grand River from Source to Neck. Understanding that this land has been rich and diverse indigenous presence since time immemorial, we would like to honor and respect the sovereignty of both First Nations in our area. Haudenosaunee people and the Six Nations of the Grand River and the Anishinaabeg people of the Mississaugas of Credit, First Nation. Yewin and Miigwech to those nations who share their land with us. We'd also like to acknowledge the neutral peoples and their ancestors and the indigenous paleo hunters who resided on these lands long ago as 10,500 years. I would also like to acknowledge those indigenous peoples who currently live, work, and learn the urban landscape around us, such as other self-identified status First Nations, Métis Unity. As an organization that is committed to reconciliation with all indigenous peoples of Turtle Island, we recognize that our land acknowledgement is only a very small first step in the process of healing and building better relationships with one another and with the land and waters. We will continue to honor our commitment to reconciliation by continuing to learn more about true and subtle responsibilities, working towards creating meaningful and systemic change in relationship building with Indigenous peoples to bring Indigenous knowledge and world views. So, I am very happy to introduce Sarah Mark tonight. Sarah is the owner and founder of Growing Hope Farm in Cambridge. Growing Hope Farm began in 2016 with the goal to help the local community, the global community, and make environmentally friendly and nutritious food in the process. Sarah has worked in social services for over 15 years, in group homes and prisons and community organizations. She has her undergraduate degree in history and a master's in theology, which, this is written down, she says, <laughs> has provided has proved entirely useless. I mean, this is <laughs> yeah. Except to assure people that she's slightly educated. <laughs> Sarah has had a passion for farming since she was very young. I think pursued it until recently because it was considered lesser than a lesser than career by her family. However, over the past seven years, she has committed to farming and learned through mentors, through trial and error, and formal and formal education about how to farm in a sustainable, humane, and regenerative way. Sarah is passionate about the land, about soil health, and about community. So after Sarah's talk, we'll have time for some questions. But right now, will you please join me in welcoming Sarah Martin. Thank you. Um, you're getting me showered today, so that's very exciting. <laughs> Normally, I'm not showered if you ever bump into me anywhere. So, and I'm uh, especially this time of year, I'm usually smelling. So, um, yes, so I actually uh, am wearing deodorant, so that's exciting. <laughs> um, yeah, my name is Sarah. Uh, this is just my family. Um, uh, this was this is old. Uh, my oldest, this one is uh, ten now, so it's probably like three or four years old, but it's just a nice, it's hard to get three small people all in a picture at the same time, so I just use it as a kind of catch-all. It's my husband, Philip, and Nolan, and Thatcher, and Quinn, and so they're now uh, 10, and then the middle in there is, he just had a birthday, so uh, he's 
seven, just turned seven, and then the last one is just about to turn nine. So they all have birthdays all in close together. So my goal in starting um, uh, Growing Hope Farm, um, we're kind of home site is over just across the river um, in Preston, and that's kind of home turf, and we own some acres there, rent some acres there, and then uh, we use some acres down in St. George, and then we just this year started to rent uh, Rare over here, as you uh, probably witnessed on Cameron Street. Um, so my goal when I first started was to um, farm in a regenerative way, um, to give back to the soil as opposed to extract, which is most, uh, kind of most um, commercial farming is extraction, um, as opposed to um, all working together. And um, I come from a social work background and so wanted to kind of invite the community along for the ride. And so usually, and the community, part of the community that's the most rejected in society. And so usually that's kind of people with developmental disabilities and people in prison or kind of in youth. And so it's kind of those three groups that I um, targeted and worked a lot with uh, pre-COVID at the farm. Kind of pre-COVID we had like 50 people or so at the farm a week. We had a lot of um, community groups in all the time um, to help like pick apples and feed the animals and clean out the chicken coop and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and so I, but with COVID everything got pulled back and so we've just this summer starting to slowly have um, some section 23 schools come back which are schools for kids who have been expelled from their local school. So then they're starting to come back but yeah, it's a slow process. Um, and then we donate 100% of the proceeds to MCC Ontario to their food security budget. Um, and so to date, we've donated, I think, 57,000 over the past six years. So it's not millions, but maybe by the time I retire, it'll get there. Um, and so that's purely for food security. So. Um, they, uh, for food, so food security would just kind of involve um, irrigation, access to land, um, giving them like a starter herd or flock, um, teaching how to farm in some cases, because most of the world lives on um, like under five acres on their farm, like subsistence living sort of idea. So um, like if they are in a, or in a, in a setting, they're, work, they're working on a lot smaller acreage if they're working in the um, farming. And so, anyway, so that's what that kind of budget line goes to. So, um, uh, so I don't take like a salary or profit from the farm. I work um, at uh, a group home for people with development disabilities and then at um, a residential treatment program um, during the week to kind of pay for that. Um, and then I do farming during the day um, for, for funsies. So um, I'm very grateful to Rare this year. I, was, uh, I wasn't sure, me and especially during COVID, me and the family were walking these trails quite a bit and uh, kind of I saw, for the, I don't know why I just saw them, but I was like, there's a lot of land here. That's interesting. And so um, we've rented our goats before to rear um, to uh, combat the, the frack, frack something, I don't know what plant it is, but anyway, to combat some invasive species um, up on the top of the hill. And um, so I'd have a bit of a relationship with rare. So uh, I reached out and I said, hey, so as a conservation, shouldn't you be working with like an organic farmer? And they're like, yes. I'm like, cool, so now that you're looking for an organic farmer, <laughs> what do you say we partner together? Um, but livestock is um, fairly, uh, especially now, this is just the front of our, if you come over to uh, Sharing Street, that's where Home Turf is, that's just our little farm shop sort of thing. Um, farm shed, it's very small. Um, so, but livestock is pretty controversial in some areas. And, uh, and there's a lot of bad press, especially about cows and emissions and all that kind of stuff. And, um, and so there's, it's not, I am here to say that it's not the cow, it's the how. Like you can, it's like everything. There's no black and, like life, there's no black and white, it's uh, gray. And so um, it's, uh, yeah, life's not like cows are bad 
end of story, or cabs are good, end of story. There's this lovely, awkward, gray area in which we live in, which is life, and so, um, and so we try and exist in that gray and try and make the most of that gray. Um, so Growing Up Farm just this year got animal welfare approved and certified grass-fed by AGW, which is one of, it's uh, a greener world, it's one of the biggest um, certifying bodies out of the states. And so, and they're just coming out, I chose them because they have a, a regenerative certification as well that's just about to come out in the next month or so. So I'm gonna get that certification as well. So that for all of the certifieds, just because I'm a sucker for punishment with paperwork. Um, so this is, so we do those two things with international community, local community, but then the kind of heart of the, uh, then the hub of it all is um, raising livestock. So we do um, chicken, beef, and pork, and goats. Um, and I have a few sheep just for funsies for me and uh, for some friends to um, enjoy. So um, the the main um, the main thing of it all is having everyone on grass on pasture because the nutrients from the animal goes into the soil. Then the soil is oh, I'll get into this in a bit a little bit later. But anyway, the premise of it all is to have everyone on grass, um, have everyone living outside, have everyone um, uh, eating grass and giving back their nutrients into the soil. So the soil is healthier and it can absorb more carbon. So um, these are just our chicken tractors. Um, they're little chevy things. Um, they're open on both ends and we move them to fresh grass every day. I think these are turkeys in there right now. And that's some ducks with some chickens. Anyway, it's a smorgasbord, but we move them every day um, and they get fed organic grain and um, and we put them in there because it would be nice and pretty to have them wander around the field, which looks very pretty and that's nice in Instagram, but um, they'll get eaten by everything because they're chickens um, and turkeys. So uh, we have them in these things just to A, keep them uh, sheltered from the wind and rain, but mostly uh, for predators because as you know around here, there's coyotes and minks and muskrats and weasels and hawks and everything eats chickens. So, um, so yeah, so we do these. And then we also have our guard dogs kind of wandering in and amongst it all, because um, things can also dig and then, which has also happened. So don't ask me to tell you that story. So, <laughs> um, so these are some piggies uh, we have. We mostly work with Cooney Cooney pigs and um, some Berkshires, which are uh, heritage breed pigs. Again, they're used to being outside, they're a heritage breed, and so having them on grass, um, fertilizing the grass, going back and uh, eating the grass, and then a uh, happy cycle of that, and then it makes the meat, which is nutrient dense. Um, and delicious. And then that's just me with a pig and some eggs. And um, uh, oh yeah, we do laying hens too because they're really good for uh, fly control actually. So, which is kind of nice. Um, so, I'm going to, oh, I'll just, I'll do that in a sec. So, I just wanted to show you um, a little two minute, well, like two, two little clips. Um, and then I'll, keep showing you about like what we're doing at Rare um, to just kind of explain where I'm coming from in terms of um, I'm going to indoctrinate you and you can take it or leave it and that's okay. Um, the, about why I believe this is um, really important and so and why livestock can actually be contribute to um, to climate change and contribute to good and not bad and um, and how it can be done well as opposed to not well. So, um, I'll just do this. And then, oh, I'll just preface, start, oh, sorry. Um, so, um, like I was saying before, um, so I'm not, obviously, I'm, I'm a farmer, not a good speaker, so don't speak good. So, <laughs> so please excuse, um, please excuse me, but um, I will try my best. 
So I'll, I'll just kind of, before I do those two video clips, I'll just kind of say, um, so we, the main thing that we do differently and every bit of agriculture has got their like pros and cons and every bit is, um, and yeah, everyone's got pros and cons. There's no good, good or bad. It's just all very different. Um, and so the, thing, the main thing that we do differently is trying to do um, rotational grazing. So you'll probably see um, the goats out there, they're moving to different spots and, um, and then they had disappeared for like a week, but they weren't actually gone. They were just in the back um, eating some uh, stuff in the back. And uh, so the idea behind that is um, like, uh, I forget who it was, I think maybe someone was like, a lot of people, because we did, we used to graze over at Ignatius uh, Jesuit Center over in Guelph, which is uh, lovely, but just very far. Um, so they're like, why can't you just let them have the whole field and they'll be happy and can run around? And I was like, hard no, um, because um, you want to make sure, so they'll eat, uh, it's kind of, it's called rotational grazing or mob grazing or strip grazing or there's all different, they're all slightly different, but the basic premise is, so you have your animals here, and it's to kind of mimic um, the, I'm sorry if I'm yelling, I'm deaf, so I yell, but I do that so that you can hopefully hear me. So you have, it's to kind of mimic the bison from eons ago. So you kind of, you have your animals here, and you keep them there for, now if you're really hardcore, some people will do it every 12 hours, no. So I do it, <laughs> I do it like every other day, um, which is still really good on the scale of things, but again, life is complicated. So not doing it every 12 hours, so every like two days, day, I'll move them, depending on, in the spring, you have to move them a lot faster, summer not as much, um, you'll move them to the next spot. And then, so now these guys over here, when they were over here, they're um, much more equally eating everything. They can't be as selective because we're kind of forcing them to eat their spinach, essentially, being like, oh, I don't want to eat that, but I'm hungry, so I'll eat it. So then there's much more even distribution of um, grazing, even distribution of manure and urine, and, um, and, and so then and we focus that on there, and then we move them on over to the next chunk. And so, we'll, the ideal, especially with goats and parasites, because they die if you just look at them funny, is um, uh, now we want to let that first part rest for at least 30 days so then that, uh, so that the grass can grow back because you only want to kind of, the idea is to kind of take half and eat half. So you want to take the top chunk and you never want to graze lower than like six inches to the ground. So because uh, there's parasites that can crawl up there and then you have to give them medication, and I don't want to do that. And so, uh, and also, um, if you cut the, to, if you get the animals to cut it too close to the ground, then it'll take way longer for it to grow back. Um, and so then, and if you let the roots go nice and deep into the ground, then they can absorb more carbon, um, and you, and it's a much happier cycle. So, um, and then we can do that all the way along, and then we can circle back. Uh, 30 days later to the original strip so um, and you can actually over the years like I've noticed even at my little tiny five acres over at scenic over the past six years we've been able to like triple the amount of um, grass that we'll get off of that my tiny little chunk so my goal is hopefully rare will let me stay and I can <laughs> and I can um, Increase the density, so you can already see it in the little spots where the um, where the manure has come. Like because we started at the beginning of May, it's way dark. It's much darker green, and it's much going to be much thicker because the also because the manure has got seeds in it as well. So it's replanting seeds. It's becoming a lot thicker, and so your uh, density can be a lot higher. And anyway, happy clapping. So I'll do a little video because I'm not the most articulate person. And here we go. I apologize for the, I'm not sure what many different subtitles are there, but um, I, it's hard to get just like a clip of something. So anyway, here we go. Do you feel hopeless about climate change and the damage we are doing to our planet? I did, but then I was shown a new way to look at the problem, which made the solution 
so obvious and so within reach, a solution that's right under our feet. Climate change is all about too much carbon in our atmosphere, but carbon's not our enemy. It's the building block of life. Everything alive is made of it. It's us. The problem and the solution are simply a matter of balance. Let's step back and look at the five pools of where carbon is stored on planet Earth. Starting about 500 million years ago, when plants appeared on land, carbon began to cycle in an amazing balance, a balance that allowed for life as we know it to evolve. Then one life form, us, figured out how to extract carbon from the fossil pool. Then we burned it for energy, putting it into play, disrupting that balance. The way we manage land and do agriculture is moving even more carbon from the soil and biosphere into the atmosphere. Specifically, we've moved 880 gigatons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which is heating up the planet and destabilizing our climate. Now the oceans have absorbed a lot of this excess carbon, which is resulting in ocean acidification and accelerating a mass extinction of sea life. So in order to save life as we know it, of course, we have to stop releasing fossil carbon. The big question is, where do we put this excess carbon to get this cycle back into balance? Well, remember when I said that the solution is right under our feet? It literally is. It's the soil. Plants with sunlight and water perform photosynthesis. They pull in carbon from the air and turn it into carbohydrates, sugars. Then they pump some of those sugars down through their roots to feed microorganisms who use that carbon to build soil. Voila, carbon moved. Plants pump it in and soil stores it. Nature's living technology is amazing. Scientists have recently discovered that applying a thin layer of compost sets up an ongoing positive feedback loop that brings more and more carbon into the soil each year. In concert with other regenerative practices like not tilling the soil, planting trees, cover crops, and planned grazing, we can build and retain gigatons of soil carbon. This is carbon farming. This is regenerative agriculture. And there is nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. Unlike more carbon in the atmosphere, more carbon in the ground is good for us. It makes healthy soil, which is nutrient rich, full of life, and holds way more water. This means more nutritious food and crops that are more resilient in the face of drought. That's good news for farmers, families, and everyone that eats. Remember this, the way we grow our food, fiber, and fuel either puts carbon up into the atmosphere or it pulls it down into the ground. The regeneration of soil is the task of our generation. Our Terrible spot to stop for that, poor gentleman. Um, so yeah, so I just I, I'm not great at explaining things, but I just found that it's a nice little clip to kind of explain. Um, and so like plants are kind of little carbon uh, absorbers, and they're fueled by the sun. And so then when animals come along and uh, nip the top off then um, it's kind of forced to grow again. And so when it grows again, it's gonna absorb more carbon again into the soil. And so yes, totally, cows are and um, are burping and farting and, and releasing carbon dioxide into the air. Yeah, that totally does that. And so, um, and but they're also, when they're on grass and when they're being moved, then they're also part of the solution in um, putting carbon back into the soil. So they say actually cows on 100% on grass fed are kind of carbon neutral. Um, cows on a feedlot would be like uh, limit, like uh, putting more carbon into the air than they would um, be helping put back into the soil. Um, so it kind of, so it's not cow, it's the cow, it's the animals are not bad. Um, so I'll just do this little, uh, there's like a two minute video here, and then I'll stop indoctrinating you, I promise. I 
consider Alan to be the uh, grass-fed guru of our, um, of our generation right now. I don't know if you'd appreciate that, but that's what I've been thinking of him as. So the cows are going through a double move today, and this is what high-density grazing is all about, multiple moves a day. With regenerative grazing, we mimic what the bison once did by building appropriately sized paddocks each day that allow us to graze hundreds of, of cattle across <laughs> each paddock. Having a lovely day. Once the cattle have eaten some of the grass, trampled some, and fertilized the area, they are immediately moved to the next paddock and then the next. This practice produces profound results that prevent overgrazing so and promote kind of tremendous fertility and growth. If we focus first and foremost on the soil and restoring that soil function and biology, then everything else comes much easier. So the important thing that differentiates between dirt and soil is soil organic matter, right? Yes. And soil organic matter is actually 50% carbon, which means if we're regenerating and rebuilding soil, we're actually putting carbon into the ground. It's the same video. Now I've been told and we've read in books that it takes hundreds to thousands of years to build back soil. How good are you doing here? We are able to build new soil organic matter at the rate of a half to 1% annually. Let's put some perspective on this. A 0.4% increase of soil organic matter on the world's agricultural soils would completely negate all current CO2 emissions. Allen is increasing his soil organic matter by 0.5% or 1% every year. If we add just one more percent of soil organic matter, that means that every single acre can hold another 25,000 gallons of water. Ready? So we just did our water infiltration test and found that it took only four seconds to infiltrate the first half inch of water. That means we're keeping our water here, right here. When you contrast that with the average farm and ranch across North America, the average water infiltration rate is less than a half inch an hour. So, so two things are happening to that water that's sitting on top of the surface now. One is that you're going to have a percentage of it that's going to evaporate. And then the second is you're going to have a higher percentage that's actually going to run off. It's going to carry with it topsoil to the effect of four tons plus per acre annually. You've got a lot of nitrates and phosphates that are leaving your soil and going downstream. They're going into our rivers and for... Uh, there we go. Um, so that's kind of why I'm trying to uh, do what I'm doing. Um, I love working with animals, I love working outside, and I like to kind of be part of a solution. Um, so the... Um, this is just, that's the cows are, <laughs> the cows are from over at Ignatius, that's from last year, and that's some of our, uh, that's Kermit, an older pig. Um, he was trying to be a boar and it didn't work. Um, and that's just some of our goats over at Home Turf, over on Sharing Street. That's uh, Theo, who you'll see out there. Um, he's not lovely to you, but he's lovely to me. And so he's a guard dog, it's his, um, he's a great Pyrenees, we have a great Pyrenees dog there and a, um, a great Pyrenees cross, uh, Angolian Shepherd, um, and so that, it's kind of in their DNA to just have like an area that is theirs and they kind of adopt the livestock that are there and they, that's their turf. So uh, we've got those guys out there protecting the goats because there's a lot of coyotes around here as I'm sure you know. Oh, that's over in Ignatius too. but. Um, this is here actually. This is just the last week. Um, this is, what are the, the spiky bushes that I was, buckthorn. Is it buckthorn? Okay, uh, yes. So there's a, there's a bunch of buckthorn at the back of the field here on Fountain Street. And so the goats went nuts for those. They were very, very, very excited. Um, they like, as you can, I don't know if you can tell, but like the bushes was all the way down here and they just like strip it in like 10 minutes, which is pretty cool. Um, and we had our first calf born, <laughs> and uh, she, he, sorry, he is, um, uh, he's probably like two weeks old now or so, and he keeps like dodging under the electric fence, but actually the last couple days he's gotten a lot better. 
and um, that's Clifford out there. That's my son's. <laughs> I know. So the the cows are very uh, chill. They've gotten used to the goats, so that's good, <laughs> as you can tell. Perfect. So I wanted to also now that I've um, kind of told you why we're doing what we're doing. Um, there's a there's kind of like a few stories that I that people always find entertaining. Um, when we first started, um, I uh, was we were super cash poor because I was home with three boys, and and so the live starting a, a livestock farm is very capital intensive, and so I kind of just made do with whatever I had, and so um, uh, it's highly entertaining to look back on now you know you kind of like see how you kind of scrape things together so um, chicken crates are uh, like those chickens that I showed at the beginning um, are pretty expensive and so I couldn't put them I couldn't buy like a chunk of those so I uh, had some old totes so I like dumped out like the Christmas decorations and stuff like that so when I wanted to go take the chickens to butcher uh, we used a place up in Alora for the, the chickens and I put them in uh, totes and then put like, loaded the chickens in totes the morning of, and you have to get there for seven, so you have to leave here at like 6.20 or so. So you have to load them at like 5.30 or so. So put the chicken, and I didn't want to put like a lid on the totes, because I'm like, well, they're gonna suffocate, right? Like I don't, this is the first time I've ever taken, I grew up in Scarborough. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so the first year or two was heavy into learning, so, um, and, and there's still, I feel like uh, farmers are always humble, um, and because you're always learning and you're always growing, especially when you add a new species. So I just started to do cows two years ago, so I feel very, uh, I'm learning about them a lot. I've done goats for the whole seven years, so I feel very comfortable with those. Um, anyway, so you're always kind of learning and growing. And uh, anyway, so I put the totes in the back of our trailer that we had and kind of put a tarp on top and tried to like ratchet strap it down to try and, uh, cause I'm like, well then it's kind of fluttering a bit, but they'll be scared so they won't want to fly out. So I'm going up like back roads at like 6.30 in the morning and I keep seeing like chickens, like one will fly away in my rear view mirror and I'm like, dang it. So this isn't good. So I, um, so I gathered up all the chickens and put them in the back of, we only had one car, we had a Subaru. Um, no, not a Subaru, sorry, that's my dad's car. We had a Matrix. And that thing can fit so much stuff in it. So I put all of the chickens um, in, uh, like just emptied the totes and put them all in the back of the Matrix. And so we had about 100 chickens in my Matrix. And, but they started to get really comfortable in the Matrix because it's a half an hour drive. So they're just like wandering around and like, moving everywhere and so we're driving and so then I discovered that if I like put on the brake really quickly that would freak them out enough to like stop wandering around and just like huddle down and the bottom of the matrix. So I would like be driving along a back road then like would put the brake on really quickly and then they'd all kind of freak out and like go down and I'm like okay here we go here we go. So then anyway so needless to say we arrived and the guy it was my first time there like now I have a very long term relationship <laughs> They like me now, but I arrived and they just like opened up the back of my matrix and I'm like, I'm here with the chickens. And they're like, okay, all right, cool, cool. So normally they arrive in something, but this is one way to do life. So we got them all out and I had to like pressure wash my car and the chickens like stink. Like, oh, poo is not that bad. And, um, and like cow poo's not that bad, but chickens and pigs are, I don't know if you've smelled, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty nasty. So the boys did not, my three children were like, it smells in here, mom. <laughs> sorry, sorry. But I, um, we fit a lot of stuff in that matrix. We put, because um, for the first while, um, we just, we just got to invest in our own herd last year, but for the first kind of five years, um, we would get donated uh, dairy goats. Um, so that's from like, there was like a weird couple back. Um, so we get day old bottle fed, uh, bottle fed goats. And so we would bottle feed them for the first six to like eight weeks and then transition them onto solids. And so I got really good at keeping baby goats alive.
drive. And, um, but we would go, I would use these totes again and like fill up the matrix and I'd go to the dairy goat farm and they would give me um, a whole bunch of baby goats, um, the boys, because they don't want boys and they just keep the females for the dairy goat farm. So um, anyway, so I would have like totes, I don't know how many I'd fit in there, probably like 25 goats in the back of the matrix. Um, and they're so loud, like, I don't know if you've heard a goat scream, but it sounds very human. So, like, even today we were taking three bucks out of the field and bringing them back home to wean them, and they're screaming like bloody murder, and it, like, it's, I would make the sound now, but it's, if you listen to a baby scream, that's what a baby goat sounds like, and they're just very dramatic. So, anyway, I'm, like, cranking up the music in the Matrix, trying to drown out, like, 25, screaming children in the back of my car and but anyway we got them all sorted and they got milk and when they got home and they're all happy happy but that poor matrix was not great um we've had our dairy we have like one dairy cow at home just for us just for our drinking um no i can't sell you any it's super legal i'll get like fined at the zoo um we have a lot of people asking um and but all the fun things happen when I'm away. And so my poor husband, who is uh, very supportive, but not interested in farming in the slightest, um, he's like, I have office hands, Sarah. I have office hands. And I do not have office hands. So um, he, I came home from work, because I work overnights. So I'll come home from work around like 9 AM. And, uh, and like our dairy cow, who had just arrived like two days before, was wandering up Sharing Street. And so we had like a few people come and they're like, well, this is an exciting morning. So we had to like herd her back to the farm and all that kind of fun stuff. So, and slowly as we've gotten, uh, as I've kind of learned more and I've been able to invest in fun things like uh, a, volt, a voltage uh, tester, very important otherwise I'm testing it myself which I did just up until this year and so now because I was so petrified of the goats getting out onto the road um, so I was like I'm just gonna bite the bullet and buy a voltage tester um, but they're like $300 for this tiny little stupid thing and but now I can tell if it's like out of like voltage or not um, and uh, but for a long time, I could kind of tell by how long the, the zap kind of stayed in my brain. And I was like, okay, that's pretty good, all right. Or no, that's not quite good enough, or, or that sort of thing. So, um, farming's kind of been one of the hardest things I've, oh, this is a nice little sunset at our place. Um, it's been uh, one of the hardest things, it's been probably, uh, next to rearing children, I would say it's one of the hardest things I've ever done, and I've worked in prisons. Um, it's uh, just when you think you feel like you've got something under control, then like, then the bird, like the bird flu thing comes in this spring, and then it hasn't rained properly, and even this morning the rain was not a lot of rain, but so we're like operating in near drought, not quite drought, but like operating in really dry conditions and trying to make sure we don't overgraze the field. And um, and every year throws at you something different. And uh, I've really enjoyed it and it uh, keeps you humble. And um, there's always kind of where there's a will, there's a way. And you're always able to figure, so figure something out. Um, I would say probably the hardest part of it all has actually been um, it's uh, has been kind of the community and just the receptiveness to organic farming in the area has been um, pretty rough. If you want to make friends, don't start a farm. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I didn't see that coming at all, and. Um, and I, I still wouldn't trade it though. Like it's, I, there's many days where I can't fathom doing it another day. Um, but yeah, but you still keep going. So, uh, oh, one of the other part, hardest parts is stereotypes and like females and farming. And everyone asks my husband, like, oh, so what do you do on the farm? Well, it's like, off his hands. I don't do anything. I do nothing. And it's like, it's all her. So, Stories about how much I've learned. <laughs> <laughs>
you're going to kind of plant like three rows, staggered of trees that are in kind of the center of the field. And then that way it's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a really cool thing. And it especially helps with drought and like gives the shade and more, yeah. It's beautiful thing. I like so that. <laughs> Um, I have a lot of friends doing this in the States, oh, cool. and I know they have the, um, the state universities there, um, the extensions, the agriculture yeah, extension universities, so yeah. um, is there any equivalent in Canada, and what are the larger support networks that you've relied on locally? Uh, Cornell, but that's in the States. Um, there's the, um, the main one I would say is the EFAO, which is the Ecological Farmers Association of Ontario. Um, they're big, uh, big bits. Um, they, uh, wealth of knowledge. They, like, you can do, um, day, uh, day seminars and online seminars and there's conferences. And then there's this Ontario Soil Network, and then there's the, um, Soil Health, oh, I'm forgetting all the acronyms, um, but it's unfortunate that there's not the same, like the, in the states, like Penn State is really good for both, and UMass, yeah, yeah, there's a few really good ones, and they, they let you, like, they'll let me have that information free, which I always, like, read their peer review articles and stuff like that, they've got such good information, so, but there's, yeah, they don't have the same university thing going on here, but there's different organizations, I don't think who else. Well, sometimes that's stuff out. Yeah. Question back there. So I was at your farm before COVID. And yeah. Um, you um, allowed us to feed the babies. Yeah, the and goats. Was, yeah, the yeah. goats. Um, and so but, um, what happened was I realized they were just the boys. Yes. Right? Yeah, and, yeah. And, um, so then I used to go get curry goat at this one place, and yeah. I ordered it this one time. And yeah. All I could think of was these little boys that we were feeding. <laughs> yeah. And so I haven't had curry goat since then. Oh. Yeah. 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 So do you still allow people to come in and do that? Do you still have that? No. Um, I was just saying we, uh, with COVID, we kind of pivoted a lot of the resources to um, to just do food production instead of kind of agritourism stuff. And you still like sell, like, uh, you, you were selling uh, eggs and... Uh, yeah, yeah, we still sell goat, we sell goat meat and, um, uh, and beef and pork and chicken and eggs, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where do you, where do you... You can go. You can go to www.growingofarm.ca and there's like an online shop there, and you can yeah. Sorry, say again. Said it's like a CSA. Yeah. Do it every month. So so we we just picked up. I don't know. Is it June or July? Or yeah. This morning. Yeah. Yeah. So you can do like anyway. I don't want to. But like you could do by monthly boxes or you can buy just individual. Yeah, we, and we found there was a lot of people who um, would see the baby goats and then wouldn't, like I would try and communicate that they are for food as well as for yeah. feeding, and people weren't a fan of that situation. Yeah, so, it's so beautiful. You had the real tiny little baby. I know. And they're so cute. people come just to feed them. I know. Them, and they would come up to the gate and they want to drink their I know. Yeah, yeah very cute. So cute. <laughs> they're very cute. Very labor intensive. Yeah. Feeding like 75 baby goats every day is wow. Yeah. But super cute. Yeah. Sure. The website again was uh, www.groycobarm.com? Yes. That's it. We're, we're, we're not going that long. We're not talking about it. Excuse me. Any other questions? And uh, so, yeah, this year, 
but we have done that in the past. So the idea is there's a guy named Joel Salatin, uh, who's, who's one of the pioneers in kind of doing this on a more commercial scale, and you, the idea is, um, which I would love to do, but uh, the, the like dream team is to like um, go smallest to largest in the field. So you'd have or largest to small. So you do the goats first because they clip the top of the grass. You have them, and then you have the cows and or sheep. You've got sheep, and then they would kind of graze the next chunk down. And then you have uh, pigs just make a mess, but um, so normally you don't put them in the mix. But you can with cooney. You do cooney coonies, which are more grass-based pig, and so that they would kind of take the next chunk, and then we have chickens, and the chicken tractors would pull them along, and by then the grass is nice and short, and so, which, um, you don't want to get too short, but like, it's short enough for a chicken to walk on, and uh, so then the chickens will eat the grass, and, uh, and fertilize it, and, and then move them off, and then, uh, so then for the same amount of land, you can get quite substantially, once you stack species, then, uh, then yeah, you can get way more nutrients on the soil and way more um, more useful land sort of thing. But the chicken are also getting the insect pests. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's the other thing. thing. Yeah, so like the um, parasites that are in the uh, cows and sheep and goats will um, hatch, again, sorry, gross, but they'll hatch out of the poo and they'll come out and go up with the blade of grass and they're like tiny, 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 but then the chickens will eat all of those little Things and so it breaks, helps break the parasite cycle in other animals, which can be a huge problem. Um, so, yeah, thank you. You should be. Yeah, yeah. 
So we've talked about it. Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? It'd be really cool. It'd be really neat to send. Like I could get paid to buy a bunch of factory to essentially like offset their carbon credits. Which so then we get mattresses and we get good food in the process. So yeah, it'd be really cool. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Sarah, again for a great presentation. And if you enjoyed this event and would like to see more events like this, we please visit our website at rarefsites at r a r e s i t s o r g and consider donations. Um, a donation is over $20, we'll receive an automatic regenerate tax receipt to send straight to your box. And we'll also like to draw your attention to the sign on the table over there, which is our new tip tac devices. We'll be getting you the entrance. Anyone who wishes to help donate to turn that green, and you can simply purchase your debit, uh, we use our MasterCard over one of the three levels of uh, giving $2, $10, $20, and a donation on that program. So now the summer is on us, and the summer camps are about to begin. We are going to take a break from hosting our conversations for conservation until the fall. And speaking of the fall, our uh, registration for the 2022 Trail Party and Walking Around for Rare is now open. And we are happy to announce that we will be returning to an in-person event this year, so please register and join us on Sunday, September 25th for a great day on the trails. Thank you for joining us. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.